Welcome to the Everyday Mindfulness Show, the -the off-the-cuff exploration of everyday aha moments and life experiences. Let's get started with your host, author, speaker, provocateur, and a bit of a goofball, Mike Domish. And welcome to another episode. Yes, this is Mike Domish, your host. And today we are here with Jennifer Taylor, Jennifer Noel Taylor, who's an energy healing practitioner, self-help motivator, and the CEO of Quantum Touch. She has dedicated her life work to helping people discover the healing power of their love. Thank you for joining us, Jennifer. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Oh, it's our honor. So to to give everybody a vibe of sort of what you do on a daily basis, do you work with people one-on-one or in groups or both? Actually, my my work actually involves managing a, a business. So um, I have I actually don't really have clients anymore. I actually uh, facilitate other people who want to have healing practices and our instructor community. That's the quantum, correct? The quantum touch. Quantum touch. Yeah, I call myself the chief magical officer of quantum touch, and um, I just work to help other people who want to have clients or, or teach energy work. And um, I do mostly the the business side. Okay, very cool. And how did you come about to being into this field and into mindfulness? Uh, that's a great question. So um, back when I was getting my degree at Cal Poly, I was studying computer science, and I studied. I did fairly well at school, and then I got into my first job and realized that I was really off track. I felt that I was not doing what I came here to do and that I was just sort of buying time and showing up at work for a paycheck. So in um, so at night, I decided to study body work because that was my true passion, and I went to massage school and uh, studied all different types of healing work, including energy healing. And the moment that I started getting into energy healing, I received this, I guess, download or message from the universe that energy medicine is my life work. And um, at that time, that was about 20 years ago, and at that time, I said, uh, yeah, right, nobody does energy medicine for money. It's a fringe practice, and uh, I just didn't believe that we could actually do energy medicine. And uh, so anyways, I continued in, in massage school, and I still had that feeling that that was my life purpose. So I continued to study energy work, and then I finally met my business partner, uh, Richard Gordon, and uh, through a series of crazy synchronicities, I ended up running his company, and that was 18 years ago. Oh, wow. That, that is an amazing story there. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and so you, start, you were running his company, and then how did you get – so at that point, were you just in the management role, or did you do both? Actually, what happened is uh, Richard uh, was giving a lecture on Maui, and I was living on Maui at the time, and I had another download – from the universe saying, yeah, you're supposed to run his company um, as the, you know, chief executive officer, like you're supposed to run the whole thing. And of course I said, well, I don't even know this guy. And now universe, you're telling me that I'm supposed to run his company. What do I do? Just go up to him and say, by the way, I'm your next CEO. Um, So what happened was Richard and I fell in love and we, I moved in with him. And about a month after I moved in, the person that was running his company said, this company is failing, and I need to get a real job, so why don't you take over? So that's how that happened. Ah, so, so you just, you listened to what you were hearing. So how do you know when you're, how do you know to decipher a thought versus a calling? That's a great question. So thoughts, I have found, tend to be inconsistent. So a thought one day may say, oh, you need to new, move to New York, And the next day you say, well, you need to move to California. Uh, uh, Thoughts may be fleeting and and all over the map and and not very clear. One day you feel like maybe your purpose is to work with animals. And the next day you feel like your purpose is to write books. And then it, I have found them to be super inconsistent. Whereas a true calling tends to be very consistent, telling you the same thing over and over again. And also feeling, there's a feeling with it of, almost like a sense of urgency or this this is who I am type of feeling. Um, it's hard to describe that feeling, but it's a, a certainty that that comes from feeling that your heart's engaged. That's what you really want to do. Is there a certain time frame you think that, that you can measure that certainty? You know what I mean? Because for instance, 
I know that I had the, had the same kind of experience where some colleagues of mine in a mastermind challenged me to do nothing for six months except my speaking and in any way speaking, whether that be in the media, from stages, and see what comes forward. And the same thing kept showing up. Once I get to about the three-month mark, I didn't do it. I just stay, I promised to hold the six months, but the same thing was calling out to me for those months three through six, and then I knew I'm going to do this. And that was the podcast. That's the show, and that was several years ago that that happened. How do you know how long is long enough to know this is a calling versus, you know, some people get urges for weeks, some people get them for months. <laughs> I think that's a great question. Um, when when you're on your true calling, I believe that people get the same urge and, and a lot of people don't follow them right away, but it gets louder and louder and louder. I don't know if you've noticed that, but uh, a lot of times that, that urge might be very faint perhaps but then it just continues to grow and get louder and louder and louder Absolutely. and yeah and if you don't follow it it'll 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 just continue <laughs> until at one point you feel like you just have to um whereas i found that um w- like the thoughts can can shift on a on a daily basis so it won't feel as compelling it might feel let's say you get a thought oh i should write a book but your heart's really not engage with that idea you you feel more burdened by the idea than inspired and to me that if you feel more burdened by an idea than inspired then it's really not your true calling oh i like that like oh man yeah i should do that but i really am not excited to do that right that's the burden versus i gotta try this i gotta try this i gotta try this yeah like if if your thoughts come with this feeling of obligation or burden or a weighty feeling like oh gosh no no i don't want to do that then it's not your true calling love it so you get the calling and in your case it's to run the business so how does mindfulness show up in your life day to day no that's a great question so i have discovered over the years that to me business has been a battle between what you think you should do versus what what your calling and your and your purpose is advising you to do. So I'll give you an example. Um, with hiring people, now hiring people is, is really difficult sometimes because if you get the wrong person on board, it, it can really take down your business. And I know this by experience. So I hired this woman uh, one time who... On paper, she looked really good, and my mind was saying, yes, you should hire her because she's qualified and she'll do a good job. And my heart was saying, no, she's not the one. She's not the right person. Well, in that case, I followed my my head, and it turned out to be a really bad hiring decision, and she ended up just causing a lot of problems in the the company. And uh, so I feel like if you practice mindfulness and ask yourself, does this uh, decision feel inspired? Is it connected to your higher purpose? Is it something that opens your heart? Or do you feel like you're doing something out of obligation or uh, application of, of just feeling like you should? So that's, to me, how you can practice mindfulness every day. Okay, so that's showing up in like a business perspective. Do you have certain practices or exercises you use to... To practice mindfulness on a you know whether it be a morning routine an afternoon routine I actually practice it on a on a I guess a, like a an hourly all the time basis I have the uh, ability and and freedom to to check in because I feel like mindfulness is really checking in with your heart so I do that on a hourly basis like like check in to how do things feel for me at the moment to me and, and am I making every every word choice every decision everything I say to my employees everything that I write in an email every customer that comes through the door to me am I connected to my heart or am I not connected and I ask that myself like as a as a practice with with everything I do very cool so you have a book coming out uh, which is Spiritual and Broke, How to Stop Struggling with Money and Live Your Purpose. Uh, when is that coming out in 18? Yeah, the book is coming out sometime in 2018. I'm still working on uh, finishing up the manuscript. I'm on actually the last uh, chapter. And uh, then I'm going to do go through um, 
a publishing process. So I'm intending for uh, around fall of this year. So what's a, what's a key to somebody who's struggling with money and applying their spirituality or mindfulness to that? Oh, here's, here's one thing that I've really noticed. It was a big mistake I was making with money. It's a mistake that I feel like a lot of people are making with money. It's really looking at what's your, what's your feeling around your situation? Like, what is the story that you're telling yourself about money? And most of the time, when I've talked to people who are struggling, the story is one of martyrhood and, and victim consciousness. And, and I was doing this because in, in these healing fields, a lot of people will feel that, uh, that it's not okay to charge money or that there somehow needs to be a martyr for the cause to be serving people. That somehow giving away their work for free helps people more than charging money. And so this martyrhood victim consciousness seems to have infused the whole healing community. And one of the biggest things that you can do is really ask yourself, am I being a martyr right now? Am I feeling like a victim? Or am I owning responsibility? And this victim consciousness is sneaky. It can really seep in at, at, at many moments. So for somebody who's not in that field, because a lot of our listeners love discussing mindfulness, but they're not in the field. They're not professionals in the mindful uh, as far as the industry of teaching mindfulness or the education of teaching mindfulness. So for others, what's a test of am I in martyrdom? Okay, so one of the things that if, let's say you have a, a more of a traditional job and you feel like you're struggling to make ends meet, um, the, the shocking statistic is that 75% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And the thing to ask yourself is do I feel like I have the power to make a change or do I feel stuck that there's no way to turn my finances around? That's the first essential question because even in the non-healing fields, um, what I've observed is a lot of people who are living paycheck to paycheck feel stuck on some level like a victim of the system or a victim of their job or their spouse or something in their in their mindset is it has this relationship to being stuck so how do they go from being hey i, I don't have the money to do what i want to do i i am financially i do feel stuck i'm in debt i have no way to make a sudden change if i do i won't have income and therefore, I'm going to go bankrupt, whatever the fear is. And I have kids, so I, and they're going to college. And so I can't afford it. I, it's not a single person who can just go bankrupt. How do you respond to that? So my response is saying, so right now, there's two questions. Are you spending money and are you bringing money in? And usually what I've found is uh, people are doing both. Money is coming in. They are, they are bringing in money and they are spending money, clearly, obviously, right? Um, so the thing is, is that who is spending the money and who is bringing the money in? It's, it's you. And to really understand that it's not, you, you, you're, you can take responsibility because once you understand that you are making decisions that keep yourself broke, that your lifestyle, that your whole lifestyle is keeping yourself broke, once you take responsibility for that and recognize that every penny that you spend and every penny that you earn is up to you. And I know it kind of sounds obvious, but this was a big aha moment for me because I always thought that I had no control over what I spent or what I earned. And, and really, you have 100% control over what you spend and what you earn. And that's the first step. So let's go to the person who's, they're not overspending. They're very frugal, but they're, they're on a limited budget due to the money they're bringing in. How mm -hmm. do you help that person realize possibilities for bringing more money in? Well, that's a, that's a good question. And so the first thing to ask the person is, is, do you believe that you can? And sometimes people have get, get so stuck that they don't even have the, the um, feeling that there is an openness that, that they can. As, uh, sometimes they feel like, well, my income is just my income and I'm just stuck and that's it. But the first thing is to open the door in the mind and saying, 
do you believe that it's possible? And once, once you believe that it's possible, then what I feel happens is opportunities, and, and this is different for everyone, but opportunities start to show up. And um, that's, that's what I've noticed is, you know, when I've personally believed I'm stuck, that I can't bring in any more money, um, I can't see opportunities to bring in more money. Whereas people who are open, I believe that opportunities do show up. No, and I, I love that idea of once I acknowledge I can make more money because I'm making this much. So why can't I make a dollar more? Why can't I make $10 more? Why can't I make $1,000 more? I'm making this. Do you think it's a pivotal point for them to start asking, how is that possible? So they can see the possibilities. Because some will just go, yes, I'm making this. And yes, I want to make more. But still do not see opportunity when it's right in front of them. And I think they're often missing the question, how is it possible for me to make more money? Am, am I going to now say, I'm, oh, I'm going to explore how that's possible. So that I'm telling my mind, look for the possibilities. Yeah, I think that. So, so our reality, I believe, is a reflection of our own personal energy and belief set. So if I believe that there are multiple opportunities to increase my income, then that's how my reality is going to appear to me. So once someone believes that there are, or, or is even just open to the idea that there are multiple opportunities to bring in more income, then the reality starts to shift because we're the directors of the reality. So, and and the way we perceive the reality is the way the reality shows up. So it's it's really a trippy world. It's it it because uh, when you see how your energy actually affects the reality, it's it's very different than how we've been raised. Well, yeah, absolutely, right? Because you can see the world differently than the way you were raised by whoever raised you, however that be parents or or just your community. How have you viewed, viewed the world versus how you may be viewing the world today at where you're at? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I noticed that you know, wealthy people tend to view the world from a perspective of opportunities, whereas people who feel like they're struggling with money tend to view the world from a perspective of limitation, Yes. Yeah. And a lot of research shows that. And, and you're someone that you have a book coming out, but you have a book out now called Love Incorporated. Yeah. Love Incorporated was a, a book about how to find your purpose and um, how to tap into what your heart is telling you. And that was the whole focus of that book. And so when you're working with people and incorporating what you just said, how to tap into what you're meant to do, what your heart's telling you to do, what is the biggest block for people getting there? I believe the biggest block is disbelief, actually, because I think most of us know what inspires us. When we were kids, we had dreams and inspiration. Most of us know what we would really like to do, but what I feel is the block is the disbelief that either uh, that it's even possible to do what we love or that um, that somehow it's not legitimate to do what we love. So, for example, in my case, I had both blocks. I didn't believe it was possible to do energy medicine for a living. And also, I didn't believe that energy medicine was legitimate or, or recognized um, that it was somehow some weird fringe job. So I believe that peop- the disbelief will block people. And, and in your book, you talk about the fact of making the big leaps you've made in your life and that there are some key signs that will tell someone when they're not on the right path. What are those key signs that tell someone, hey, I do have these, you know, we've mentioned several times today, these blocks. There are these, you know, the thought processes that are causing the problems. So what do you think are the two key signs to somebody recognizing they're not on that right path? I think the, there's the two signs that I feel and that I've experienced are a, a sense of depression, that life's not worth living, that what's the point, uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm bored or, or uninspired. And that brings me to the second one, feeling a sense of flatness around what you're doing, a sense of I'm just coming for a paycheck, a sense of a, a lack of inspiration to me indicates that you're not, you're not living your purpose. And is there an exact process someone can go through to find that purpose, like literally a formula? 
I, I feel that it's actually really simple. And the way to find your purpose is to listen to what your heart's saying. Turn off the mind for a little bit and, and listen to what your heart is saying. And sometimes I feel like our society creates an environment where it's very hard to connect with the heart. There's a lot of noise, a lot of distractions, uh, and a lot of times a lot of people uh, give less uh, credence to what the heart's saying. Um, the, the overemphasis on intellectualism, I, I feel, tends to block us from the heart. And so just getting back to that, spending some time in a sense of gratitude and connecting to your heart, I believe, is the first inroad into discovering your purpose. How do you help someone get to that quietness? A lot of people struggle <laughs> or they don't even want to try to learn meditation. So how do you mm -hmm. help that person hear the you know hear quiet, so hear nothing so they can see what comes forward? If a person, you know, for some people, I think meditation may, may have, may be intimidating or they may say, I, I don't understand what I'm doing. Um, so I have a different sort of way to meditate that may help people who are really new to it. And the way to do that is to do something that you love with full attention. So for example, for someone it may be petting their cat or dog. Like, I mean, it sounds really simple, but if you are doing something you love and you give it full attention, you've automatically have turned off the mind and you're connecting to the heart because you're connecting to something you love. Or, or maybe for me, it was, you know, gardening and connecting, really connecting and paying my full attention to the flowers that were growing in my work in the garden. Because when you do that, you automatically open the heart. And when you open the heart, it tends to quiet the mind. And there are a lot of people out there stuck in the rat race, the routine, who don't have anything like that that they're doing. They don't mm -hmm. have gardening and they feel like, I just don't have time for anything but work. You know, I don't have anything but work, family, or whatever stresses they have. For that person, where do you even start to find something that can get you that place where you're in the zone? I would say that... That person, can, anyone can find 10 minutes a day. Anyone, no matter what your situation is. And I believe that even in just 10 minutes of full openness, full love, full connection, will, you will start to hear the messages from your heart. And, and I think turning off the TV, I mean, I know that a lot of people I've run into say, I don't have any time, and yet they're spending two hours watching TV every day. And so let's say they, they get that time. They take the 10 minutes, the 20 minutes. How do they help themselves realize what activity will put me in the zone? You know, Because you used a good example of I use gardening to get in the zone. But what if somebody doesn't know an activity that does that for them? Right. Well, I feel like then finding something that you love to do. Now, okay, I know a lot of people are, are, so, are feeling so disconnected and, and broken right now that they may not even remember what it's like to love something that they do, but I feel like that remembering something that you love to do, maybe it's just going for a walk or, or something that that you love. I know that we all have that love in there somewhere, and remembering what that is, uh, is, is so key. And, and if you really can't connect, then just trying something, trying something different, trying something new can help. Yeah, that's what, you know, that's what they tell people who come out of relationships, right? Just go and do stuff. F find something to put on your calendar that's fun. If it's dancing, take a dance class. If it's woodworking, take a woodworking class. But allow yourself to explore. You don't have to know the answer today to what is my, your example of gardening. You don't have to figure that out today. It can take time, right? I don't have to do it in the next 10 minutes. Yeah, and, and just finding something, you know, for example, uh, maybe volunteering at your Humane Society where you can you know, play with animals. I think that's a, an amazing way to, to connect because um, young, you know, kittens or puppies, like they put you, they put a lot of people into that zone, I believe. So if you don't want a pet, like volunteer or just, just experiment a little bit and, um, and, and get into something that opens your heart. 
I love that. And a lot of people have on the show and over the years talk about how much the outdoors can draw people out. So I like that you said bring up a, you know, a walk. And animals can give that vibe, that same kind of energy. But even just going to a park and just sitting or walking and just saying, all right, I'm just going to be present to what I'm thinking can be so powerful. And, and you've been great here, Jennifer. In addition to your two books, what are books that have been highly impactful to your life and getting you to where you are today? Uh, that's a great question. Um so one of my favorite authors, actually, his name is Marcus Rothkrantz, and, and nobody's, uh, I, I'm not sure if a lot of people have heard of him, but he's wrote books like The Prosperity Secret and Instructions for a New Life, and he's written a lot of great books on, on also raw food and um, just working with that mindset. He does a lot of really fun videos. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of his work, so it's Marcus Rothkrantz. Um, another book that I have really have enjoyed is... Um, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert's book on creati- creativity called Big Magic. I love that book. So those are a couple of things that I've been reading lately. I love it. That's great stuff. So Elizabeth's Big Magic. And mm-hmm. then and I already found, and I didn't know about his book, so I already got that on here. So we'll have that in the show notes. I want awesome. to thank you for joining us. It's been wonderful. Great. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. If somebody wants to get a hold of you, how? what's the best way for them to do that? I, I actually have two websites right now. If you're interested in energy medicine, quantumtouch.com is, is my company, and we have a lot of information on energy medicine there. Um, and then I have an author site. It's uh, jennifernoeltaylor.com. And if you go to my site, I'm giving away the first three chapters of my new book uh, if you sign up for my mailing list. And uh, so you can get a chance to, to read uh, what I'm talking about in the new book. And um, thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I wish you the best with your new book launch coming up this later this year. Very exciting. Yeah, very exciting. Thank you so much. For everyone listening, you may find a little mindfulness in every day and lead with love. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you on our next episode. We appreciate you being a part of our vibrant, oftentimes silly, and always vulnerable community. If you have an idea, a thought, want to sponsor the show, or just want to say hi, send us an email at listen at everydaymindfulnessshow.com and check us out at everydaymindfulnessshow.com. Have a joyful, mindful week.